J.P. Morgan had it, had the, the game to itself and did buy, okay, kept the price down so it could buy. Now some, you know, it stopped going down and uh, people seem to be interested. Certainly some big buyers seem to be uh, seem to be interested. So the tide can change in, in, in like uh, almost with the, the flip of a, of, a, of a light switch. It's, uh, it's a fine line between glut and, uh, and, uh, and shortage in silver. And uh, if, if investors take, take hold and want to buy it, uh, we're going to have a shortage. As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com What good does gold do me anyway? I can't use it for anything. Well, I think I found a form you might appreciate. Wow. That's beautiful. Wow, I can wear that just about anywhere. And you can take it with you through airport security and across borders. It's small and compact and lightweight, and you can even hand it down through generations. Your first ounce of silver is at spot price, and you get free shipping on any order over $99 at sdbullion.com rp. Reluctant Preppers provides educational awareness and commentary only. Opinions expressed do not constitute personalized financial advice. Viewers are encouraged to do their own research and seek qualified personal financial consultation before making investment decisions. Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. It's been a long time since we've had this prestigious guest with us. This is Ted Butler. He's a well-known and well-followed analyst on the silver markets in particular, and I've had a long history uh, with him personally because it was he who originally alerted me to the importance of physical silver as a hedge against uh, risk and also as a major industrial uh, strategic commodity. Uh, Ted, thank you so much for joining us here again on Reluctant Preppers. Thank, thank you, Donegan. Glad to be here. We recently, your name came up again recently because we had Alistair McLeod from uh, Gold Money on talking about some theories that he had been um, coming up with about who might be behind and what forces might be behind some major, rather unusual action on the silver futures market. And he penned an article about a whale is accumulating silver futures, and he came on our channel to talk about that. You had a different perspective that you came out with saying in an article entitled Wrong Whale, and we will have links to both of those articles in the description of this video. But we thought if you could please uh, give us your perspectives on uh, what you think is driving the unusual action both on the COMEX and perhaps the London Futures Exchange on uh, silver, because the more well-rounded perspective we can give our viewers, the better we can all be aware and prepared, and that's our tagline on Reluctant Preppers. So if you could kind of give us a start on where you are coming from and your perspectives on that. Uh, be glad to. It, it, uh, I think it's a worthy uh, discussion. Um, first of all, there's no disagreement at all um, about uh, a very large buyer or buyers, uh, maybe a couple, um, emerging in the, uh, in the COMEX uh, silver futures market. Um, I have been writing about that for, uh, for maybe a month or so before uh, Alistair's uh, article came out. So we're, we're in complete uh, agreement that a very large buyer uh, or maybe a couple of buyers has uh, come into the uh, COMEX silver futures market uh, starting the end of April, but really picking up between the, uh, the end of May to the, to the end of June. So no arguing about uh, big buying taking place, very unusual big buying taking place. And let me mention in passing that today is Sunday, July 28th, 2019, with a perspective to the dates that you mentioned. Go ahead. Super. Um, the only disagreement I had is uh, in studying the data closely, which I, I've, I've studied for, for decades, is that uh, there was a disagreement as to who the uh, potential buyer may, may be. It was more likely, uh, based upon the data, to be in the, uh, the managed money speculative 
um, side of the equation, the breakdown in the disaggregated um, commitment, commitment of traders report, rather than in the commercial. I, I, I see that, uh, yeah, there was probably a, a commercial in the big four uh, long category, but it was at least two and maybe three managed money traders. So um, the, 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 any disagreement was just in who the likely buyer um, was. Since that time, um, there's been another very big development, and that was very unusual. It was unprecedented. We've never seen the four largest long traders in COMEX uh, silver futures in history, uh, going back you know, 30, 40 years, um, ever hold a larger position on the long side than the four largest traders on, on the short side. It was uh, one of those things that uh, just never occurred to where the, uh, the longs, there were more longs, uh, bigger longs, than there were bigger shorts, uh, but that changed. It's reversed again as of this uh, past uh, week. This uh, commitment of traders report shows that the, the four largest shorts are now uh, larger than the four largest longs, but I don't want to get too technical. Um, uh, for a while, uh, the longs were bigger than the shorts. That never happened. Another thing that has happened um, in the interim and following the revelation that there was a very big uh, long or longs in COMEX silver futures is that there's been an absolute explosion um, an inflow of physical metal into the world's silver ETFs, uh, the largest being the uh, SLV, um, but there are a couple of other big uh, silver ETFs out there. These are exchange-traded funds that uh, basically hold uh, physical silver, okay, as the uh, premise for the uh, for, 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 for the uh, for the security. Uh, people invest in shares of uh, SLV and other silver ETFs um, with the expectation and uh, uh, guarantee, according to the prospectus, that um, physical metal matches the uh, amount of shares outstanding. And it's very popular. There's, you know, uh, hundreds of millions of, of ounces. Most of the world's silver is held in these uh, in these S, S, in these uh, ETFs, uh, SLV being uh, the largest. So um, over the last uh, uh, couple of weeks, it's uh, it's been a recent development. There's been a uh, just a, just a, an explosion and in, you know of inflows, massive physical inflows on the order of more than fifty five oh million ounces. Okay, has come into these uh, silver ETFs in the interim since we've had this discussion about the big buyer and COMEX futures, which is a, a different trading venue. This is the physical silver ETFs, and there's been. Uh, well, more than 50 million ounces have come in over the past month, uh, 35 million uh, or so into the SLV. When you say physical inflows, help us understand what you're referring to. Sure. Okay. Well, these are uh, thousand ounce bars of silver that are reported deposited into these various uh, silver ETFs. SLV is the biggest. Uh, they have like uh, 300 and almost 360 million ounces in that one ETF alone. It's uh, the biggest holding of physical silver in the world. And over the past month, um, close to 35 million ounces have come new silver, physical silver bars, 1,000-ounce bars have come in to the SLV, deposited in the trust, and that's because... There was an explosion uh, since uh, July 15th um, of trading volume in the SLV and new buying. Okay, new buying took place. You have to have a, sell a seller for every buyer, of course, but uh, the trading volume in SLV uh, and the other ETFs, silver ETFs, just exploded when, as the price started going up. Okay, it's the it was when we started moving and we had like a dollar, dollar fifty rally in silver, dating from July fifteenth 
over that exact time, um, the trading volume in, in SLV and the other silver ETFs increased dramatically, and it was new buying um, because new metal, additional metal, uh, was deposited into these uh, silver ETFs. All told, you know, 15 million ounces, it's a lot of silver, 35 million into the SLV, about 10 million into the uh, uh, SIVR, another ETF, and uh, about uh, uh, five or six or eight million into the uh, uh, silver ETF run by Deutsche Bank. Uh, those three, and and also the uh, silver uh, in, uh, ETF in in Switzerland, the ZKB. Uh, th- th- those were the four principal um, uh, depositories or where the buying took place and the physical silver was deposited. Now this is separate, okay, and distinct from the discussion about the silver futures and the whales, a big buyer, and, and the silver futures and who it might be. This is a separate thing. Now we're talking about the, the physical silver ETFs, the exchange-traded funds, where you know 50 million ounces plus, more than 50 million ounces, has been deposited in physical silver into these ETFs. I want to be clear about that. There are two separate... Uh, and distinct occurrence, occurrences or developments, the big uh, buyer that became obvious via the Commitment of Traders report in the silver, COMEX silver futures market, and then separately, okay, the tremendous inflow into the uh, silver ETFs, physical silver coming in. I just uh, Does that sound clear to you so far? Yeah, I just wasn't aware that um, that uh, players could deposit physical silver in those accounts. I, I thought that they were just exchange-traded funds where people could buy or sell shares of the funds themselves and that it was the responsibility of the fund managers to acquire sufficient uh, physical silver to cover uh, the, the, the monies deposited into the account. Oh, no, you, you have it right. That's exactly right. So if people come in and buy shares, okay, of... Uh, of the silver ETF, say the SLV, okay, and as it's an open-ended fund, okay, and meaning that uh, if new people want to buy shares, they can do that, and they and, and and as they're buying those shares, and and new shares are being created, okay, there's a requirement in the prospectus and uh, that physical silver, mu- new physical silver must come in and match the amount of new shares that were bought in the silver ETF, the SLV and the others. So you have it right. It's, it's uh, new buying comes in. It's not just air. Um, as, as new shares are being created, um, people paying money for these shares, obviously, um, they have to be backed according to the prospectus by um, – New physical metal. If the share, if, if the if the trust is growing, new people are coming in. It's like a mutual fund, uh, open-ended mutual fund. New people buy shares. The 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 trust, the sellers of those shares, the creators of those shares, which are called authorized participants, okay, are required to deposit physical metal to match the amount of new money, new shares being created. So. Um, it's a recent development, this tremendous new inflow, okay, of, uh, say, 35 million ounces into the SLV, over 50 million ounces when you include all the leading uh, silver ETFs in the world. But it's, it's something, it's, maybe it's, it's not widely known at this moment, um, but because it, it, it's all, you know, occurred basically since July 15th. Um, is when it when it started, um, so uh, you, you want to be clear that two different things on, on the COMEX, we're trading futures contracts as paper contracts, as derivatives contract, as a long and as a short. Okay, and it's an open contract. It may or may not end in physical delivery. Okay, most of the time it doesn't. Ninety-seven percent of the time, the contracts are not 
uh, matched up with physical delivery on the COMEX. But in the SLV or in the other silver ETFs, okay, the, there is hard metal, hard physical metal um, behind each share. Um, unless there's a, a short position in the in the shares, I don't want to get too complicated. But as of July 15th, that that hasn't been increased at all. The short position. So that's the mechanics. That's how it works. It's how this trust, the SLV, has worked since it started in um, in 2006. So we're going on 13 years, and uh, this is the way it functions. Uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding and uh, bias, okay, prejudice against uh, the, uh, the the silver ETFs. Um, not on my part. I'm a, I'm a, I'm an advocate. I'm a, I, I think it's the uh, I've always thought uh, you know it was uh, going to be the uh, silver investor's best friend, uh, even though there's uh, many who you know who, who, who don't don't trust it. Okay. Um, but that's you know uh, that, that's just you know, makes the world go around agreements and disagreements. Um, but anyway, there's two separate things. One, the big paper buyer, uh, okay, uh, on on the COMEX, and then separately this tremendous, I mean, mind-boggling of, of flows of physical new physical metal into the, into these silver ETFs. Well, because both instances, both developments were highly unusual, okay, um, the last time we saw the inflows of this type into the silver ETF was just prior with the end of uh, starting at the end of 2010 into April of 2011 when silver ran up more than $25 to almost $50 an ounce. And the run-up in silver, to my mind, okay, was was caused by the tremendous uh, investor buying of physical silver, principally through the uh, the silver ETF, the SLV. The SLV uh, had added like 60 million ounces between the fall of 2010 to the uh, to, to the top at April, the end of April 2011. I say that was the principal catalyst or driver to the price run up to fifty dollars uh, was the uh, was the tremendous buying in the physical market via uh, the the silver ETFs. Um, so, you know, when you see these inflows come in, you can't help but. Uh, but make some comparisons uh, in your mind as to uh, you know what took place back then. Now back then we ran you know oh, oh, twenty five dollars higher to almost fifty dollars. This time we've run uh, you know a dollar fifty maybe, and so it's it's not the same um, you know comparison as far as price rise. But there's no doubt uh, that this, is, this is public data that the the the, the Physical silver, tremendous amounts have come into this S SLV and the other silver ETFs. Um, what I'm, what I would point out is that you take the two big developments, the one that you started asking me about, the uh, the buying in the COMEX uh, futures contracts by unknown big traders, and then you turn around and all of a sudden you got this other unusual development, this tremendous inflow in a physical silver into these ETFs and you got I got to say to myself hey are these related or connected or not and I'd say it's they got to be connected it's like it's that they don't it just doesn't happen you know out of the blue so what is the connection what is the connection between the um Tremendous uh, buildup in the uh, concentrated long position, the paper contracts on the COMEX, and now uh, this big physical inflow into the silver ETFs. Um, this is something that's happened. It's, it's kind of unique. It is unique to to silver. We 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 don't have these two things present in gold, for instance. In gold. There's no suggestion whatsoever that a big concentrated buyer has come into 
the COMEX gold futures market, the data is clear. It's like the, there's no, the, the, the concentrated short position in the COMEX gold futures market is like uh, so much greater than the concentrated long position. There hasn't been any buildup in the concentrated long position in gold, just in COMEX silver. And now we got this tremendous inflow of physical silver into the, into the silver ETFs, and we don't have really any big inflow, okay, giant inflow on, on a comparable basis into the gold ETF. So it's, it, it, this is unique to silver. This is, uh, we got the COMEX concentrated long position that's unusual, never happened before. And now we have this sudden burst of buying and, um, and physical deposits into the silver ETFs. And I, can't help but think that there's a connection. They just uh, just didn't happen independent of one another. And to give you the bottom line, okay, what it what it strikes me as, since I was um, more convinced that the big buyer on the COMEX was a managed money hedge fund type trader rather than a commercial, that was our you know the only difference I think we had I had between what Alistair uh, wrote. Um, now that we're seeing these these big uh, inflows into the physical silver, which you know basically occurred after this discussion about the the co- who was who was holding the Comex uh, futures position, it looks it it looks clear at this point that. Um, it's uh, it's more likely to be a, a, a hedge fund or uh, institutional investor of some type that is converting, in my opinion, is converting these futures contracts via simple arbitrage um, methodologies that I won't get into the details. It's really easy to do. Converting the, 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 the COMEX silver futures contracts into physical silver via the silver ETFs. And if that's, somebody's doing that, and it looks to me that that's what's happening, it's more likely to be an investor, hedge fund type, manage money, hedge fund type uh, operator, rather than a commercial account that, um, or China or somebody like that. I mean, I, I just don't, I think it's more likely, I can't, guarantee it I, you know we'll, we should know as as time goes on who, who the big buyer is at some point it's it's going it, to it's likely to come out um, so that's uh, that's where we stand we're in the middle of this, this is current we're we're talking uh, you know something that has occurred you know basically over the last uh, couple of weeks um, this uh, tremendous uh, inflow into um, the uh, silver ETFs and uh, the recognition that there was a big COMEX buyer. So the, the bottom line to me, it looks like uh, a new buyer has emerged, okay, in silver. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, 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 they're bi- it's big numbers. It's, it's, it's on, a, on the order of like a Hunt Brothers or a Warren Buffett in, in 1998. Um, not as big as... As J.P. Morgan, I, I still think they're the, the biggest holder by far, but um, it looks to me, and uh, you know, it's not clear yet, we have to see, but uh, in, in trying to speculate and analyze, it looks like another new um, player has come in to buy silver. Uh, it looks like a, a sophisticated buyer because he, he did... Uh, in my mind, everything right, everything that, for argument's sake, that I would have done, in other words, buy a bunch of futures contracts first, lock in the price, and then take your time and uh, convert it into physical. And um, that appears to me what's what's being done. And, uh, you know, it, it's potentially, if true, um, it, it, it's potentially very big news. It's interesting that you're helping us to understand the connection between these major events, and they do seem to be uh, pointing in the same direction as far as uh, they're not balancing each other out. They're actually, they actually seem synergistic in, in terms of someone 
taking a position that's already that they've already protected and then going ahead and uh, accumulating. If we could uh, turn our attention to a number of viewers' questions that have been submitted, unless there's anything else on this particular topic you'd like to leave us with. No, that's what questions would be fine. All right. We've got one from the next chapter. It says, what school are you in? Peter Schiff, inflation is coming, or Harry Dent, deflation is coming? Neither. I'm not. Uh, it, it doesn't. Uh, the way I look at the market, it's not. Uh, it doesn't really matter to me if it's inflation, deflation, whatever. I think that's uh, outside what's really important in the silver market. I'm, I'm kind of focused on silver, and so I don't. I don't really care about it. You know, look, I care, but I, I, it's not what goes into my analysis. So in other words, you think that silver is not just to be looked at as a as any other commodity where, you know, measuring it in US dollars and inflation or deflation is, you know, going to definitely impact the cost of most the price in US dollars of most commodities. You're saying there's other factors that you think are are more uh, significant in moving the price of silver. Yeah, I mean on a on a running scale, if you list the, you know, the the, the most, uh, you know, the 20 or 50 most important factors that go into the uh, the silver market. I want to concentrate on the, uh, you know, the one, two, and three. Okay, uh, and and I would put uh, the other discussions. They're not meaningless by any stretch of imagination. Um, it's it's a complicated issue. There's a lot of things that perhaps go into influencing the price. But whether we have general inflation or deflation or the Federal Reserve or interest rates, the stock market, I I, I couldn't care less. George West asks, is there a silver shortage or a supply glut? The JPM silver hoard, no matter who ultimately owns it, was amassed during a time when global industrial, industrial demand was fully satisfied. Doesn't this suggest a physical silver production excess or a supply glut? And what would the impact have been on the silver price if the JPM hoard were not amassed but alternatively had to be absorbed by the marketplace? Um, that's a good question. It, look, it's it's a it's a fine line. I mean, there's it's like it, it's not necessarily, you know, just if you have uh, it's very hard in any commodity, any industrial commodity, to actually you know balance uh, you know supply and demand over a given period of time. There's got to be a little overage or underage or something like that. It's it's not. Uh, but if you're a, a few ounces over for argument's sake in silver at the end of the year um i i don't know if i'd call that a glut okay i mean that's a that, that's a pejorative kind of word i wouldn't call it if you were a, a few ounces short uh, a shortage either so to, to be balanced what the, the 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 important point is is that um when you look at um, prices are made at the margin, in other words, whether how, how much of a glut or how much of an overage you have or how much of a shortage you have, you got to have is going to be one one or the other. Um, in, in the case of silver, however, what, what's important to recognize is that um, of the billion ounces annually that are produced. Uh, 800 and some are changed from mining and the rest from recycling. Um, probably of, of, of a billion ounces, uh, 900 million are consumed or more, 950 million, are consumed each year in either industrial applications or um, things that coins and jewelry and things that uh, uh, take and use up you know, uh, 90 to 95 percent of the new silver that's 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 being produced. So we're only left with okay, five um, percent, no more than 10 percent, uh, 50 million to 100 million ounces per year is uh, left over and available for world investment. And if you take okay that amount. Okay, I'll, you want to call it a glut. I mean, you could call it a glut if you want. But um, when you when you look at the at the world and how many people are in it, how much investment buying there is, and you're really looking out of every billion ounces that is produced that are produced each year, okay, in the world, 
okay, and that only, say, 50 or 100 million ounces is left over and available for investment, and that's like, you know, a uh, billion dollars or $2 billion worth of uh, of silver that is available to the world's investors. Um, if investors, look, I'm giving you an example here with these silver ETFs and this this COMEX uh, buying where one buyer could come in and, and just bought all the excess for one year. So what happens if there's more demand for this remaining silver that's left over after we satisfy all the, you know, solar panels and uh, iPhones and all the stuff that we use silver for? If, if the world if it comes in and investors want to buy silver, okay, they're going to drive the price up to uh, astronomical levels. Um, and the difference between a shortage and, and a glut is, is, a, is a fine line in silver because the wild card is um, will investors uh, come in and buy it. Now, they haven't come in for eight years. I'd be the first to admit that because uh, J.P. Morgan has had a stranglehold on the price via shorting on the COMEX and kept the price down. People don't buy uh, anything if, unless it's going up in price, so they haven't been buying silver. So J.P. Morgan had it, had the, the game to itself and did buy, okay, kept the price down so it could buy. Now some, you know, it stopped co- going down, and uh, people seem to be interested. Certainly, some big buyers seem to be uh, seem to be interested. So the tide can change in, in, in like uh, almost with the, the flip of a, of, a, of a light switch. It's uh, is a fine line between glut and uh, and uh, and shortage in silver. And uh, if if investors take take hold and want to buy it, uh, we're going to have a shortage. Do we have one right this minute? Maybe, maybe not. Did we have a shortage in the last eight years? Hell no. We had, a, we did have a, a, a glut of so, but, but conditions change. Okay. And the amount of money out there that is capable of buying all the silver that's available is a mismatch that we'll only see in the fullness of time. Thank you. That's uh, very fully uh, expounding on that question. Um, Organic Flat Earth Prepper asks, what do the elite and central bankers think of the people stacking silver during these last seven to eight years? Are they planning a strategy against them? Um, no, nah, that's like above, uh, you know, my pay grade. I, I don't, I'm not, uh, I, I don't associate with the elite and, uh, I don't know if pe- that many people have been buying silver in the, in the, in the last eight years. Um, Look, I, I don't think it matters uh, yeah, to, to really anyone, uh, governments or whatever, what the what the what the price of silver is or whatever. I'm not uh, I'm not kind of hung up on uh, you know like uh, th- those kind of uh, you know um, you know what might be going on in the world and it's uh, it's supply and demand and who's buying and who's selling. It's I think it drives prices. We've got one from uh, from uh, Hector Gutierrez who says maybe we are having a moderate economic reset, just a rollover kind of thing. So, do you believe that? Because you've talked recently here about industrial demand for silver uh, being highly influenced. You talked about what are the top few factors. Do you believe that a? Uh, this is me expounding on the question. Do you believe that a the global economic uh, true status of the global economy? And its effect on the demand for industrial uses of silver is a, is one of your top uh, drivers of of silver demand, and therefore silver price imp- impact. Um, yeah, I mean supply and demand is, is is what matters in the long run, but it can be um, you know overshadowed uh, for 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 long periods of time. Um, look, come out of the, the. I'm assuming that there's no. Uh, you know, uh, big uh, upheaval ahead in uh, general world economic activity. There certainly hasn't been over the last decade or so. Um, but even if 
even if there is some type of uh, you know uh, serious uh, economic downturn, I, I think that's where the the question I, it may really be rooted is uh, you know what happens to silver if we go into you know a massive depression or economic contraction and you know industrial demand is down and all this kind of stuff look that that's that's going to have an effect but of all the commodities i can think of um in in such a scenario even if um uh industrial demand uh, weakens okay dramatically and it won't just be for for silver it's got to be for everything for copper and oil and you know all the stuff where we uh, the the byproduct stuff that uh, that where we get most of the silver from um i think people will be uh, perhaps and i'm not rooting for this people will be so uh, you know frightened and uh, motivated by a severe downturn that they're going to turn probably to the the things that they've turned to in in prior you know bad times and uh, silver would appear to be high on the list look I, i'm not saying buy silver because of uh, the world's going to hell in a handbasket i'm saying if the world does go to hell in a handbasket it's it shouldn't negatively affect silver it's not the reason you know i'm buying i'm buying it because i don't think there's enough of it I think people, big buyers, have overlooked it for so long because it hasn't gone up in price. And now I see strong signs that someone big and new might be coming into the market. That's at the very top of the list, okay, for thinking that uh, that that silvers could go higher from here. I would like to add one thing, and look, is it possible that we could have, you know, one more sell-off in silver or a sell-off in silver? And the answer is yes, only because the current configuration, the market structure, okay, on the COMEX, where there's a very long managed money, a very big managed money long position, and a very big a commercial short position, commercial being banks, uh, basically, are short. When we've had this, conf- and it's true in gold, too, If when we've had this configuration and this structure in the past, we have sold off because, you know, the market's manipulated, and this is how it's manipulated. So I want to stipulate that, look, we could go down, uh, you know, the crooks on the COMEX can rig this thing down. They've, they've been able to do it all along. Will they this time? I don't know. Um, with all these other things piling up, okay, this uh, concentrated long position, this tremendous inflow into physical silver, into the ETFs, there's enough new things around. There's like a, a list as long as your arm as, as, as to how many bullish things are out there for both silver and gold. There's only one potential negative, and that one potential negative is this crooked COMEX, okay, and whether the commercials can rig the price lower again to set off technical fund selling. Um, I, they have always have. I, I, I'm betting against it this time, but not to acknowledge that it's possible, okay, it would, would, would be a disservice. I mean, it's, if we go down, and I guess you can always allow for that, this is the only reason we will go down, because of this damn crooked COMEX. Um, I don't know if they can pull it off this time. I'm playing it like they won't pull it off, but I'm fully cognizant that, uh, that they might. Interesting. Uh, we've got a related question based on what you've been talking about from Stephen Gross, who says, at some point, I'm assuming Warren Buffett will move into silver and precious metals again. How does this current whale buying of the futures market compare to when Warren Buffett purchased sir- silver several years ago? You know, it's a good question. I've had a, a, a friend uh, raise, raise the issue uh, recently. Do you think it's Warren Buffett or whatever? And I, look, I don't. It's a guess. I mean, I, we, we don't know. You know, if I, if I knew, I'd say. If I, if I, you don't know, it's a guess. Um, I don't think it's Buffett, only because he had his run at uh, at silver, and uh, he didn't handle it too well. I mean, he 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 ended up. I don't want to get into a whole big thing. He ended up after he bought the silver. He he ended up into being, a, in my opinion, a big short seller 
in the futures contracts, milking the market, getting some big return on his physical silver holdings. He was selling short, in my opinion, against the other technical funds back at the time in the early 2000s. And he ended up losing his silver as a result of going short the futures. And I don't think he wants to um, reenact and 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 bring that back in, in into into discussion. And, and if that's the case, I don't think he's going to want to touch the silver. But you got to remember, you know, the, the silver I'm talking about that may have been bought here. So let's just say it's around a hundred, a hundred and twenty-five million ounces that may be converted from the futures contracts into the physical silver via the ETS. We're talking about $2 billion, 125 million ounces times $15 an ounce comes to where it was bought, comes to a little bit less than $2 billion. There are so many entities out there in the world that can afford to buy Two billion dollars worth of silver, or two billion dollars worth of anything, okay? That it, it would shock you that uh, how, how many uh, possible entities there are. The real question is not so much who the buyer may be, okay? The big buyer may be. The question is what took them so long? What are they? What are they even waiting for? This thing has been. Um, dangling out here, the facts about silver have been uh, well known for for, for a long time. Um, uh, so the the question is not whether someone big has bought it, but what what took them so long? Why you know why wait until now? I, it, it, so anyway, so there is plenty of plenty of potential. It doesn't have to be Warren Buffett. Doesn't have to be anybody that you would recognize the name. But um, if it comes out that that it's a big buyer. Um, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if it if it was a well known name. I I just don't know why it hasn't been done early early than this because it's it, it silver has everything going for it. Well, we are running out of time, uh, Ted, and uh, wonder if you want to give any final words of wisdom to our audience before we let you go. Uh, no, nah, I kind of just, uh, mentioned it. I mean, look, a, a, as good as it looks and it looks, and it looks good, a, good, good to me, good to go, uh, to the upside, you know, you always want to be prepared that, uh, you know, they, it, it, it may not be a straight line. They may, uh, you know, slam it one more time, uh, the same as they have over the, over the years, over the decades. Um, it's important this, I mean, it, it, don't, be in a position. Don't don't be on margin. Don't don't hold silver. Where if we do get a sell off, okay, you're gonna end up losing your position. Okay, that would be the the worst worst possible thing. Um, anything that you do, the best thing to do is you know own it on a on a physical basis, fully paid for, the whole nine yards, no margin. Um, so. Uh, be prepared that, uh, you know, it may not go uh, straight up. It may. Um, uh, but don't, don't, don't l l let them, l let them take your silver away from you due to market action because, you know, you, you, you borrowed against it or there's a margin call of some time. That, that would be the, you know, the, the one thing I would say uh, to avoid completely. Any kind of margin, any kind of borrowed money, cash on the barrel head and sit tight. Thank you, Ted. We've been speaking with Ted Butler, founder of butlerresearch.com and widely followed analyst of the silver market. Ted, as always, thank you for joining us and clearing up our any misconceptions and giving us a lot more information about your perspectives on what's going on with the silver market. Thanks for the opportunity, Donegan. Hey, Reluctant Preppers. If you haven't heard, we've already started our monthly one ounce U.S. Silver Eagle thank you gift to one active Patreon subscriber each month, signed by your host, Dunnigan Kaiser. And you don't want to miss out on that. Please help us grow by subscribing today at patreon.com slash reluctantpreppers.